What would it look like for us to pray like Jesus did, to pray our heart and our vulnerabilities, but to also pray, God, not my will, but your will be done. God, would you put your desires in my heart? Let me offload this stuff. Let me get it out. I'm an outward processor. We gotta, we gotta get it out. And will you change me? Will you transform me to, to work for your purposes, your goodness, your kingdom on earth? Well, what a joy it is to know that you've chosen to join us today for this 30 minute teaching ministry of Bel Air Church. You know, as a church family, we've been around for almost 70 years ministering to the city of LA and our surroundings. Now we are reaching across the globe. And our hope today is that you would find some encouragement, maybe some inspiration in your own walk with the Lord as we seek together to journey in deeper ways to be more like Jesus everywhere with everyone. Well, we have been in the midst of this prayer sermon series. We've kicked off the new year with this sermon series on Lord, teach us to pray because our desire as a people is to be more like Jesus in this way, more like his followers in this way, to grow deep and wide in our prayer life. And we find so many teachings uh, in the Bible. We've, we've looked at some different characters throughout scripture. We've learned about some laments, prayers of adoration, thanksgiving, confession. We have not hesitated to go deeply in this area of prayer. So I'm excited to journey with you today. And as we even think about this idea of prayer, we have to ask the question just at the forefront, just to kind of get us on the same page, what is prayer? I wanna demystify it a little bit for us. Prayer is simply a conversation with God. It's simply being with Jesus. It's this, this dialogue, not this monologue, although we often act like it's a monologue. It's this dialogue, it's this back and forth, it's this give and take. So we enter into that relationship and I feel like it's the primary starting point to intimacy with God. Just being with God, our true selves, our full selves, entering into that conversation. So that's what prayer is. That's all that prayer is, just entering into that communion with the Lord. Now, over the past several weeks, like we said, we have journeyed through different characters, different lenses. We have learned, we have grown in different areas. And today I'm excited because we get to learn a little bit more from Jesus, the man himself in Luke chapter 11. So if you could turn there now in your Bibles, if you've got a Bible at home, maybe you've got a smartphone, you can open it up to Luke chapter 11. I'll be reading from the NRSV version, Luke chapter 11, one through four. Listen to the reading of God's word. He, being Jesus, was praying in a certain place. And after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. This, my friends, is the reading of God's word. As we say together every week, thanks be to God. First, I just wanna say something real quick. I think some of you probably were expecting me to say a little bit more in that prayer, right? Because there are two versions of this prayer in scripture that we read. The other one is in Matthew chapter six. It's a little bit longer of a version, but here we've got kind of a shortened version of this prayer. And so I'll kind of be going back and forth a little bit between these two, but there's such rich teaching for us in this prayer. But I just wanna take a left turn for a second. Come with me. The new year has begun and I am already thinking about summertime. How many of you, show of hands, are thinking about the vacations that you wanna take this summer? That, that is me. I am often dreaming and planning and, and just kind of fantasizing about the vacations I'm gonna take, particularly to the sparkling azure blue of the Mediterranean. I, I love the Italian coast, the French Riviera. I'm always dreaming about that. The only problem is I gotta take a plane to get there. I have to get on a plane and fly halfway across the world. And I've shared this before, I'm, I'm kind of a nervous flyer. Um, and by kind of, I mean very nervous. Ask my husband, Mike. 
I will often grip his hands. My, my, I have these sweaty, clammy, nervous hands on a plane and I'm just like, Mike, let's pray. And do you know what prayer comes out of my mouth in those moments of stress and anxiety? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. I am uttering this prayer fervently under my breath. And I know that people can kind of hear me with an earshot and I'm sure it probably makes people nervous who weren't actually nervous. But for me, it brings me such consolation. In that moment of fear and anxiety as we're about to take off, which is statistically kind of the scariest time in a plane, I'm surrendered in this prayer, this traditional, classic, historical prayer. And I find consolation and peace in praying it. So I don't know about you, but what is the prayer that you utter in times of stress or anxiety? In times of traffic on the 405 freeway or whatever freeway you find yourself stuck in traffic? What's the prayer that comes to mind for you? Many of us, especially in our times of need, we, we turn to God in prayer. And sometimes it's just simply, God, help. God, show up. God, would you do something? But for 2,000 years, followers of Christ have been praying this prayer as a way to lead us and guide us and grow us in knowing who God is and what God longs for us. So let's go back to scripture and see what Jesus is inviting us to in this prayer. And again, I'm gonna give a nod to Matthew 6 quite a few times throughout this, this teaching this morning. So we see in our text that Jesus had been praying, okay? Right off the bat, we see that Jesus had been praying. His disciples saw him pray, they heard him pray. And one of them asks him, Lord, would you teach us? Teach us to pray the way you pray. And one thing I want to point out here, it's really interesting to me, is that at this point, the disciples had seen Jesus do all kinds of miracles. He had fed the 5,000 with a few loaves and a few fishes. He had healed all kinds of people who were sick, all kinds of ailments. He had calmed the storm. He had raised people from the dead. They had witnessed so many miracles. But we don't actually have any kind of record of the disciples asking Jesus, teach us how to do a miracle. But they ask him here, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And I really believe it's because they knew that this is where it starts. This is where it starts. It's with communion with the Father. Entering into a relationship where you pray and you petition and you receive and transform. So Jesus does, he teaches them. He teaches them how to pray this very encouraging and challenging and centering prayer for his followers then and still for us today. So now by no means, this is not going to be a, a full, like complete deep dive teaching on the Lord's prayer. We could do that. That should be a whole nother sermon series, but we are gonna touch on some of these petitions that Jesus teaches us to pray. So starting in verse two, Jesus just simply says, Father, he is appealing to God as father, as a loving parent, this intimate picture of the God of the universe. Jesus is saying, you can talk to God like this. You can talk to a loving and compassionate God in terms of being a parent. And this would have been massively surprising for the disciples just to have this type of intimacy, this, this invitation to speak to the divine in this way. And going on, we see, your kingdom come, your kingdom come. We're to pray, Father, your kingdom come. Your rule, your righteousness, your justice, may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus throughout his ministry would often talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of God? For Jesus, for God, it's about redemption and reconciliation. It's about wholeness and flourishing and shalom, the peace of God penetrating the earth. That is the kingdom of God. And we're to pray for these things. God, your will be done. And we also see echoes of this in Matthew 6 and in the garden. We're gonna read about this later. Jesus's own petitions in the garden of Gethsemane, your will be done. In verse three, we see, give us this day 
our daily bread. Jesus says to you and I, pray for daily provision. Pray for the nourishment and care that you need each day. Do we do this? This is hard because I think we often pray for like the whole year to be like solid. Just, you know, God, would you just fill up my bank account? Like make sure it's all like locked and loaded. I want the storehouse to be full. And here Jesus is saying, no, pray for daily provision from me. I think this is Christ's invitation to become more dependent on him to sustain us. Not to get filled up on Sundays and then just kind of sputter out the rest of the week, but to get filled up every single day by the bread of life. This is a scary prayer in a, in a city, in a world, in a culture that just is so independent and so self-reliant and so like, I can do it on my own. Jesus is saying, pray this. This is the second petition right after pray for my kingdom to come. God says, pray for daily provision. And I think it's really interesting here because if you notice, it's a little redundant. It's like, give us this day, our daily bread. Like we, we got it, day, daily, it's twice. Daily here is a very unusual Greek word, epiousios. It's, it's very, really strange. It's found nowhere else in the biblical text. It's found nowhere else actually, in fact, in any Greek literature, epiousios. Some scholars kind of argue over what really is the true meaning behind this word. It's debated and we translate here daily bread, but yet some think it could really be bread necessary for existence or according to fourth century theologian and translator, St. Jerome, panis super substantialis. Say that twice, panis substantialis, super substantialis. Literally this translate translates super substantial bread. Super substantial bread. Jesus is saying, pray for this. Now I wonder, just a thought maybe, I don't know, maybe if we're praying here, not just for the ordinary bread of everyday nourishment, but we're praying for Christ's self. Bread for the soul, the bread of life, Jesus, give us yourself. Let that sustain us each day. I love this image I have of my son. He's six years old. We've really been into sourdough bread lately. You know, there's like some health benefits eating sour, sourdough bread. I'm like, oh no, twist my arm. We put some like butter, like good butter on the sourdough bread. And then we sprinkle it with this like fancy sea salt and the other day, unprovoked, my son just takes a bite of the sourdough bread and just sinks his teeth into it and just savors it with his eyes closed. And I'm just like, yes, like, is there anything better than just good bread? So that moment for me was just highlighting in a soul kind of way, am I savoring the goodness of God and his provision in my life? I also think of the phrase, all I need today is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. I still have that right by my coffee maker in the morning and I read it every day and I'm like, true words were never spoken. Just need a, a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus to get through this day. Continuing on in verse four, we see forgive us our sins or in Matthew, we see debts. I know we got probably some two teams here. We got sinners, trespasses, we got debtors going on. It says, as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us, hold up, Jesus, wait a minute. Like I was with you, I'm following you. I'm like, yes, your kingdom, daily provision. You're asking me, you're asking us to forgive like the God of the universe forgives. To use the same kind of grace, a fully unmerited one, a merciful pardon, unearned, that kind of forgiveness. You're saying we're to do that? And notice the everyone here, everyone. I don't think that's just a chance that that happened to be in there, everyone, because there might be some people who we feel a little bit more inclined to forgive, right? Like, you know what, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and forgive them. But who would, who would it take some some work to forgive. 
Jesus is saying, forgive them the way the Father in heaven forgives us. That is a radical thing to pray and God fully expects it to be a practical one too. Are we playing church? Are we playing it? Or are we living it out? Do we believe this to be true to our lives? Jesus is saying, ask this, live into this, submit to this, be gracious, just as God has been gracious to you. And he goes on in verse, uh, I think it's five here. He says, and lead us not into temptation. Some say tests or trials. I don't know about you, but I can avoid everything except temptation. Have to get a little nod to my dad. That was, that was a dad joke right there. Jesus knows temptation. He's got a history with it, right? He was led into the wilderness. He was tempted three times. And I love how Henry Nouwen breaks it down, the three temptations of Christ, being relevant, being spectacular, and being powerful. And these are the same temptations, friends, that we face every day. What will we do in times of trial and temptation? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Matthew 6's version adds this, but deliver us from evil. Supply a way out, he's saying. The internal temptation towards evil, we all have that propensity. None of us are void of this. Like we all have this in us. And here we're praying, God, protect me, guide me from those moments I feel destructive where I'm disillusioned and discouraged. Give me the strength to choose you. Give me a moment of clarity. I not only don't want to be faced with temptation, but when I do... Help me not to fall into it. Sustain me. So to summarize, Jesus is teaching us to ask God for justice and peace to reign in the world. For provision for what we need today, not just in a physical way, but in a soul kind of way. Grace. We're to pray for grace, to become grace-filled people who forgive just as God forgave us. To admit our weaknesses and that we are broken and needing the strength and sustenance of God to deliver us from oppression. Now, I know that there's many of you right there who probably are really comfortable with asking prayers, you know, show of hands, like 90% of our prayers are probably like, God, I need, God, can you help? God, would you just? Jesus' teaching today might be regarding an area that maybe you've left out of your prayer life. Which one would it be? Would it be justice? Would it be a deeper dependence on him? Would it be forgiving somebody who maybe you feel like doesn't deserve it at all? What might God be inviting you to, to pray for in a deeper way through the Lord's prayer? And there's some of you that might be, you know, not comfortable with making requests. Maybe you don't feel worthy to ask God for anything. Maybe you don't know how to ask God for what you need. It's it's not that you, maybe you don't want to bother God, you know? But don't forget that God is your loving father. God will never turn you away. God wants to hear the vulnerabilities of your heart. He delights in you coming to him. We see all kinds of, like we said, we've we've seen a lot of characters, a lot of lenses, a lot of types of prayer. We see a really powerful one here, giving us a guide to ask and petition for. But we we also see Jesus show us another way to pray in the garden of Gethsemane. So Jesus teaches us, we've got this structure of the Lord's prayer. And then we also see a more intimate version of prayer. In Matthew verses 26, 38 through 44, it reads this. Then Jesus said to them, my soul is deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Skipping to verse 42, he says, again, he went away for the second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, 
saying the same thing. We see Jesus laying out the petitions of his heart in this scene. He is filled with anxiety and grief. His friends have failed him. He turns to the father and he prays, God, let there be another way. Take this cup from me. And he says it three times, not once, not twice, three times. He keeps asking. He is vulnerable and open with his father, whom he trusts. Friends, our prayers can look like this too. We can go before God just as Jesus did. We can pour out the truth of where we're at and what we're feeling. I love how Henry Nouwen says this. He says, praying is no easy matter. It demands a relationship in which you allow someone other than yourself to enter into the very center of your person, to see there what you would rather leave in darkness and to touch there what you would rather leave untouched. Maybe the invitation for some of us today is to be a little more honest in our prayers. Recently, I was praying in the middle of the night. This, this happens to me. This is where kind of anxieties can come up for me. I don't know if you can relate to that. But there's this moment of prayer for me. And I'm like, God, I need your peace. Where's your peace? You promised me your peace. God, give me your peace. And I felt like the Lord say to me, Rebecca, name it. And I said, name what? Name your fears. Name your anxieties. You might know, you, I know them, but I want you to name them, lay it out. There's something about naming them that unburdens the heart. And God knows this. Jesus was always asking, tell me what you need. Tell God what you need, ask. Oh, by the way, when I did that, when I offloaded those burdens, I received God's peace. God promise us promises us his peace. I love how um, Anne Lamott says this. She says, churches are a good place to pray, but so are garages, cars, mountains, showers, and dance floors. It doesn't matter where you are. You can always know that God will be there to meet you. Prayer is this concrete reminder to us that we're never alone. We are never without the active presence of a loving and compassionate God. We can always reach out and always be met. He will never grow tired or weary of your requests. He will never eye roll when you come at him with an ask, with a longing from your heart. God longs to meet you with compassion that never fails. Philippians 4, 5 through 7 reads, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, with thanksgiving, by prayer and petition, offer your request to God. And what? And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Go to the Lord. Friends, I want to touch on one more little challenge for us as we close. What would it look like for us to pray like Jesus did? To pray the Lord's prayer, to pray our heart and our vulnerabilities, but to also pray, God, not my will, but your will be done. God, would you put your desires in my heart? Let me offload this stuff. Let me get it out. I'm an outward processor. We gotta, we gotta get it out. And will you change me? Will you transform me to, to work for your purposes, your goodness, your kingdom on earth. C.S. Lewis wrote this, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping, and it does not change God. It changes me. We need to be a people of prayer, a people who pray and long for that communion of God at all times, waking or sleeping, that it would just flow out of us and transform us. Friends, we're not a people who hedge our hopes or hedge our disappointments. We come fully to God's feet with all that we are, fully expecting to be met and sustained. Friends, what would it look like for us to pray the way that Jesus prayed? 
to believe that God meets us in our longings and our asking and trust and surrender that he will meet and transform us for his good purposes. What might that look like for you today? Would you join me in praying together the way Jesus taught his disciples to pray? And I pray that this is a fresh revelation for you as we read these words from 2,000 years ago, from the words of Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Hi, my name is Joanne Marcos, and I'm the Director of Missions and Outreach here at Bel Air Church. For decades, we've had the honor of being in relationship with many foundational organizations here in Los Angeles, like the Union Rescue Mission and Hope Gardens, who serve families at risk. We also serve alongside churches around the world in vulnerable areas of Mexico, India, the Congo, and more. Visit belair.org forward slash outreach to learn how you can get involved by seeing and serving others through the outreach ministry here at Bel Air Church. And if you've been encouraged by this broadcast or the ministry of Bel Air Church, I invite you to give financially so that we can continue the work of this church in this community, in our city, and around the world. Visit belair.org forward slash give. And if you're local to Los Angeles, we invite you to join us on campus for one of our three services, 9 a.m. for traditional service and 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Visit belair.org for more information and we can't wait to see you. God bless you.